It is a beautiful morning downtown Phoenix, Arizona, or Central Phoenix. On my way to see a uh, 1939 Lincoln Zephyr P12 coupe, which my understanding is a coupe is actually kind of a two-seater, maybe three-seater car. There's no back seat. And uh, very beautiful uh, lines. I'd like to see one in person. Uh, J.B. Donaldson owns this car and has completely gone through it from top to bottom. And uh, I want to learn more about it and uh, bring you along and see what we can learn. bad case of car syndrome and um, when I was in it was about 10 years ago I was at the uh, Phoenix Art Museum and there was a there was a display of uh, various cars mostly hand-built mostly one-offs and uh, right in the middle of it was this exact same car uh, exact same color even and um, Unconsciously, I, I recreated the same car ten years later, hmm. and uh, it was only very recently that I looked back at the photos from the, the, the exhibit. Was called Curves of Steel, and it was at the, the museum for a number of weeks, and it just was an amazing display of really, really rare uh, cars that don't get out very often. Uh, they are not cars that are even shown. They're, they were from private collections and. I have no idea how they talked him into providing them, but in that group of amazing one-offs was a production car, which you would have thought would have been uh, not quite up to what they were, and, and in fact, it was just just as beautiful and uh, you know just as much a command of your of your attention as as any of the other cars. So it really struck me, and I'd never seen one um, in all the years I've been doing this, and I was. I was moved by it um, to try and find one, and then I found out they're very hard to find. Uh, um, very, it's not even a matter of money, it's just there aren't any, and so you have to get out and, and look for them and talk to Zephyr people, and you have to, they have to know that you're uh, worthy of having a, one of these, it's not like a, a money thing, really. And um, the 38 in, in the back uh, I bought from a gentleman who had done about three-fourths of the car and did a really good job with it and then just lost interest and after a lot of uh, arm wrestling and um, personal um, whining and crying um, he agreed to sell it to me and uh, that is my driver and this is a 39 in the foreground here is a very similar body style uh, continuation of the 38 but uh, uh, it's done to a much higher level it's not a street car, it's not a car that's driven routinely like the 38. And um, both of them are, are have their own charm and their own char characteristics and personality. Um, but the uh, the 39, we decided to upgrade some things that we felt like uh, could have been done at the time, very hopefully very tastefully. Um, the wood grain dash, uh, the leather seats, um, the leather door panels that we designed were all, you know, things that we designed in our in our shop but with our people and uh, executed. And um, those are really the only things that that um, we needed doing. And um, the real real problem with these cars is that occasionally they get overdone. They start getting carried away with you know, modern equipment and modern things. So all we've done is add an automatic transmission and. Uh, more modern rear end and drive shaft so that we can, the car, car handles better, it, it starts and runs and drives with anybody. Um, people in my family can now operate this car without having to learn how to drive a stick, which is a dying art. And um, so it's a, uh, it's a more practical version, uh, the 39 is. Uh, 38 is my personal driver and I don't really obsess over whether it gets scratched or whether it has, it's dirty or not. Um, the other car is kind of the prima donna in the two. And uh, 
you know, he gets treated differently, no question. Tell me what's under the hood that people might not immediately know. One of the reasons people like Zephyrs is that they came with a V12 engine, which was really a hallmark of a, a different kind of car, mostly uh, Packards and Cadillacs and that sort of thing had V12s and V16s even. But for a, let's call it a middle of the road car to have a V12 was, was quite unique. In fact, I don't think it was ever done before or since. So you have an opportunity as a, as a potential buyer in that period to buy a V12 car, which is obviously beautiful, but uh, has that one single uh, talking point that you can you know, rub up against your buddies and say, you know, I got a 12, what do you got? And uh, that was no small thing. They sold uh, in not great numbers compared to other cars, of course, because they were more expensive, but in terms of a new car coming out and being accepted, it was, it was wildly popular in that regard. And they even set the tone it, uh, not only at Ford, but at General Motors and at Chrysler and some of the other places. They immediately, when the 37 uh, and 8 came, Zephyr came out, the other factories immediately started trying to clone it and trying to change their designs to go to much toward closer toward what a, a Zephyr is in terms of styling cues, the grill, the, the slope back, all of that stuff really was pioneered by uh, Bob DeGore, who was uh, Edsel Ford's designer that he picked. And uh, when they de decided to do the Zephyr, the cost was set aside. There was no consideration given very little to the fact that it was a completely round car, that it was aerodynamic, but it was also extremely expensive to produce. But it was being done at Lincoln, and Edsel's company, which was Lincoln, was uh, the gift that his father gave him so that he, had, he could have his own autonomy and, and design the cars the way he wanted to, build the cars the way he wanted. And with, without the constant um, pressure of price uh, considerations. So uh, this was the very first product that Essel uh, was able to do uh, that was his his own making and his own baby and uh, it was uh, it was shocking at the time that it was uh, so so different and yet so well done mm -hmm. and that a lot of the cars the airflow is an example of car was very different it was another attempt at at, at uh, styling based on airflow but it just didn't work it, it just didn't it didn't catch on with the people and uh, it's not a particularly attractive car it's very aerodynamic but it just it just didn't go because it didn't have the beauty that the, that the zephyr had right now on this particular v12 how is it set up as far as carburation exhaust uh, any other features about it that are interesting well the 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 theory was that it was going to be um, use a lot of the parts in the Ford V8, which is also uh, rather revolutionary at the time. The four-cylinder engines were the were the norm, and and um, the old man wanted to have an eight-cylinder car. He hated six cylinders. Nobody really knows why, but he, he loved the idea of an eight-cylinder, and they pioneered it in '31, put it in a production car in '32. And was wildly successful for that, that that reason. Everything else was four cylinder or six cylinder. Now he's coming out with eight cylinder. So he had that that uh, magic number that would stick in people's minds when they were trying to make a decision. And it was very powerful uh, difference. And uh, it added uh, more horsepower. It, uh, it it didn't add a lot in the way of expense. So uh, it was a very successful marketing. Concept and Edsel really took his father's uh, idea and and added four more cylinders and in in effect uh, nowadays of course when you say it's still cylinders everyone's eyes open up uh, and rightfully so but that was part of the appeal uh, Edsel was a very erudite guy he was he traveled extensively in Europe and studied the cars that were being built over there and there were some beautiful you know, cars being designed way ahead of their time. 
and he wanted to bring those principles to, to America and and use it as a design concept because he had control of Lincoln and uh, he was very successful doing it. I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah. What's the carburation then set up in this car? Well, they came with two, two a single two barrel, which was a, was a big two barrel. That was, uh, you gotta remember this is before multiple carbs and, and uh, you know, bigger carburetors, four barrels, for instance, were really around. They were, they were present in the cars from Europe, for instance. But it was very rare for an American car to have multiple carburetors. And so this was a kind of accommodation because it was a big two barrel. And remember the roads were not that great. I mean, if you could operate a car between zero and 40, that was really the, the, the place that they lived. That was the thing they had to do well. And this car is extremely well, does very well in that regard. Um, in a modern world, it needs more carburetors. It needs more fuel, but there's a danger there that you're going to over carburet it. And then when you, Accelerated, you know, you're going to flood the, the engine with too much air and gasoline. So it's very, very important to design that multiple carburetor setup, and that's what we've done in this case. And uh, we use some incredible people like Bob Ream and some of our fabricators fabricated as its own intake, um, aluminum intake, which in and of itself is a piece of engineering uh, excellence, but it's also beautifully made. So it it has that one unique feature that really no other car has. Um, and it's still streetable. I mean, it operates from zero to 60 or zero to 80. Uh, it doesn't seem to care. It's more, more like a modern car. Right on. So um, not to obsess about all this, but so that's a custom made, designed and built custom yeah, manifold? We, yeah, we, we recognize that the single two barrel was not gonna be functional in today's world, so we there are three twos out there that are cast, but they're not particularly well designed in terms of flow. So we built one that would flow better, and uh, it, it actually outperforms, in my mind, any of the three two setups or two two setups that were made because they had all kinds of manufacturing limitations. They it, it limited them in terms of their airflow. So uh, it's all about airflow, and that was a you know was, was not a defined or developed science yet when the car was built. Right. Um, nowadays, of course, it's everything. We understand how important it is. And um, so we can take those principles of today and, and, and go back and redesign the intake and the carburetor setups um, to be more functional in today's world. Cool. All right, let's go on in the interior. Tell me about some of the interesting uh, design uh, applications on the interior. Well, the interior um, was where I think that they fell down, to be honest. Um, okay. <clears throat> the car is magnificent from the outside, but when you get around to looking on the inside, the dash was this kind of hideous, I don't know, we call it pelican poop brown. And it, it, it's just, it just stops you in your tracks because the shape of the dash is magnificent. Everything else about it, the instruments, the location of everything is really good. It's like they got to a certain point and said, oh, I'll just make it any old color. And, and that just killed it. I mean, it just, it, it just doesn't work. So we pulled it all apart and integrated a, a period correct a technique which is called wood graining and uh, it has to be done very carefully it's very slow very tedious um, takes a lot of time and uh, but if you get it right it's just it's magnificent it fits more with the overall design concept of the car and uh, complements it without without detracting mm -hmm. from the original design and that's not easy to do these guys are very talented and, and when you when you try to redesign something that somebody had a lot of talent did, you have to be very careful that you don't you don't step on that original design and end up proving yourself to be a fool. Right. And there's a lot of that going on. If you look around the custom car mm -hmm. uh, people, they have a habit of doing that. And I'm not going to name names, but there are some cars out there that would have been much better off my yeah. own. <laughs> but um, you know, everybody's got a monkey with it, um, and some guys know what they're doing. And some guys over overcook it, I think, and it ends up looking uh, cartoonish. And we 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 obviously didn't want to do that with this car. It's, it's a very it deserves better. Right. So we thought about it for a long, long, long time. We got everybody to contribute. My my trim guy is a masterful guy, and we talked about how that might work. We redesigned the door panels. We redesigned the seats to be period correct, but also be more complementary 
to the overall design and not look at like they were done in the modern age, which is a, a sure telltale that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You've got to think 1938 and 9. You can't think today because it doesn't work. You can't put this period on top of that period. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, on the exterior, especially the rear, like mm -hmm. the rear three quarter, which we're kind of looking at right now, mm -hmm. um, how unusual is that proportion in its day? It's probably the defining part of the whole car because if you, for instance, take a production car, let's say a 40 Ford or a 39 Ford and park it next to you, if you saw them in different venues, you'd say, well, I see some similarities there. And there are some. But the thing to remember is that this car uh, was created off by itself. And yes, it had, to, it had to remind you of something made by Ford Motor Company, but it was not built by Ford Motor Company. Most of these cars, the coupes, the convertibles, um, the Phaetons, all that stuff was not built at the factory anyway. Almost all of the cars, especially in that period, were built somewhere else. They were built in specialty houses where they were hired to build 10 of these and 20 of those and 100 of these. The factories had, had did not have the time or the resources to make a limited edition coupes and convertibles and that sort of thing. So it was farmed out to other very, very talented people, but they were not actually built by Ford. But So Ford is influencing in the background, he's Edsel Ford, you know. <laughs> he's not going to completely uh, destroy that link with his dad. Um, why should he? It, it's a perfectly good design idea that they're working on now. Everything since 33 became aerodynamic at Ford Motor Company. So this car is really kind of a hyperdrive into the next millennium, um, but it also has to keep some cues that it's, it's really a Ford because that, that's how it, the Ford takes cachet from it being a Ford. And so he's obviously going back and saying, look, Dad, hey, you know, I'm helping you out here. And then Dad was very was very good about let, leaving him alone at Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I think probably for that reason, many others, obviously, he's a very talented guy. But, but uh, it, was, it was wonderful to see. And there's a lot of controversy about the, the relationship between the father and the son. And um, unfortunately, Edsel died fairly young. But he was he burned like a star. I mean, he was just an amazing guy. He did all this work for art and, and sciences and, and automobile design. He was a very busy guy in the background. He was not an out front guy. But he hired some of the most talented people on the earth to work for, for him and did some amazing work. The, the museums in Detroit that he uh, paid for and the artists that he hired, you might have heard of some of them. And um, one of them was made, married to Frida, Frida. so um, it's, it's uh, a guy who worked in the background that had tremendous influence on a lot mm -hmm. of things, and we're still seeing that today. How many body styles did the Zephyr come out with? Well, they had only about four or five. That's another one of their um, secrets is that they kind of kept it simple. You know, in, in a small production setting, these cars were incredibly expensive to make. There's no flat panel on that car. You, I defy you to find me another car. There are very few examples that don't have any flat panels. And that is an engineering and production nightmare to make something out of all those curves, put it together, weld it, finish it. It's, it's very expensive and very time consuming. So they don't like curves. They like flat panels because they go bang and they're out of there and they're on the car. So he just said, I don't care about all that. These cars went through a many years when they were not popular they were considered to be parts cars for continentals for instance you know take the motor out throw the zephyr away there was an era where people just didn't quite get it yet and of course that added to the fact that there weren't any because they got destroyed and parted out and thrown away so now you've got even less of a beautiful car to work with that's another reason why when you're in the zephyr crowd you're more interested in what you can do to help the other guy then wondering how much money you can get out of it. You know, if you've got a hood, I might have a fender. You know, so there's a lot of trading going on there. And uh, we do that uh, with the people that have them and have parts and have a, a stock of things. Uh, rarely is money uh, passed. It's more, uh, I got one of these and I, you got two of those and we'll just figure that Make out. Yeah, we, I, I have one friend, uh, Alan Decker, who 
you know, has helped me tremendously. And we got to the point where we were trying to figure out what stuff was worth. And finally, we just said to hell with it. You know, here, you need one of these, I need one of those. And, and it, magically, you know, you get what you want rather than, you know, running the risk that you're going to offend a friend. You know I mean? How do you do that tactfully when you got some rare stuff on the planet? How do you say this is worth a lot of money? You're better off just give it to me. <laughs> you know? And typically inside the hobby, uh, you know, the prices are more reasonable. Sometimes you got to be patient. I had to wait a long time to get to 38. Um, you just got to be patient. It's not like a Camaro, you just go buy one. It doesn't work like that. You have to uh, establish a relationship, establish the fact that you're worthy, that you're not just going to buy it to sell it or chop it up or something. I think more than almost anybody, the people that own these cars want to know where it's going to go. And they want to know what's going to happen to it and for, for really good reasons. Um, if you're just going to chop it up and turn it into a custom, probably not going to get much in the way of interest from the seller. But if you're, if you can look the guy in the eye and say, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to make uh, very few changes to, to modernize it. Um, you'll have a better audience than if you go out and just say, here's the money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the guy who bought that 38 from would take any amount of money from the guy who's going to chop it and put a late model engine in it. Right. I don't I think he would just you know, turn his nose up. Right. So you got to be careful of that and be patient and take a couple of years to do it and especially look for unique parts being available to the car when you buy it because there's, there's no resource for convertible parts as a for instance a coupe only parts are, are really tough to come up with even the seat the front seat is unique to the coupe convertible so there are things that can be made there are people like us and and Booz Harrell and Merv Atkins that can give you a certain amount of parts. And it changes it. You, you'll find that if you keep checking and keep checking that the really rare things you might be missing will show up at these various places. They're always out looking for them. But to get the basic body shell would be the, the goal. Okay. Start with that. Um, if, just because it's difficult to find complete cars and, and for you know, an affordable price. Okay, so now if you're decided you wanted to sell your 39 yeah what would the buyer expect like like i i believe you we didn't even talk about this but you had the engine rebuilt right uh you know you've got a a good transmission and rear end in there you've yeah. got disc brakes like what would it be like to just if you were to if someone were to buy the 39 what kind of ownership experience could they expect from that well, the first thing you have to do is preserve what is good about the car. And this is a, this is a, what a lot of owners struggle with. They listen to too many people that don't know what they're talking about. And they end up doing really stupid things to really good cars. Most automobiles were designed by very talented, very <laughs> capable people. They don't need redesigning and reconstructing and replacing this and replacing that just because it, it, it doesn't work that way. Almost every car built from the mid thirties on it is a drivable car as they come. Um, you can augment that a little bit in the, in this narrow era here. Um, we felt that the V12 built by a, a really capable man. And we had one of the best Ed Smith, uh, who has about 50 years of experience. Um, did an, an amazing job of building the engine. Uh, those guys are out there. Uh, not a lot of them, but they're out there. And uh, I'd be happy to refer people to the people that I know to be good uh, so that you have at least a reference for them. Because there's not a lot of them out there, and some of them are good and some of them aren't, um, like anything else. So that's part of the experience. Be patient, you know. Sit back and think about it a lot. If you ever get your hands on one, the biggest problem is that you want to immediately start doing something, and that's stupid. You need to sit back, talk to some people who know, um, talk to people that you respect and say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think of that? And get a consensus and then make your own call. What do you feel about you personal, your personal connection to these cars and family legacy and what your son thinks about them and, and what you'd like to see happen with, the, with any of your cars? Really? Well, there's a practical... Uh, consideration in all of the cars that I have and that is first of all stop assuming that they like particular cars and start asking 
you have to arm them with the information to take care of the car. And you probably would be really nice, for instance, in the case of the cars that we are going to be keeping, pass on. Most of them are going to be automatic uh, transmission cars. There are There is one exception. Um, but um, make sure they know how to drive them. Because if they don't drive them, they're not going to keep them. And they're not going to take care of them. And then your your all that work you did is going to be lost.